Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. This is Wisdom Wednesday. For quite some time now, I've designated Wednesday as the day to study the book of Proverbs. Uh, we've already covered the first 15 chapters. They, those uh, videos are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so I hope you will go back and watch those. And today I'm going to pick up where I left off, and we're going to start with chapter 16, verse 1. Um, as is my uh, custom, I am a KJV firstist. So I'll look at uh, the verse uh, with the KJV first. Um, if, if I think it might be helpful, then I may look at the Amplified Version or some other translation uh, if the KJV is uh, not that clear to me. So let's begin, and starting with chapter 16, verse 1, it says, The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Well, the preparations of the heart in man and the answer of his tongue is from the Lord. Well, right away, I think I better look at the Amplify and see if it's helpful. The plans and reflections of the heart belong to man, but the wise answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Well, that was quite helpful. Uh, this, this goes along with what I've said over and over again in other videos. And that is that the Bible is where we go to test everything. Um, and when it says, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord, or in the Amplified, it says, the wise answer of the tongue is from the Lord. From the Lord means uh, we get our truth from the Lord. And where do we find it? We don't find it in the traditions of man or from someone on a pulpit uh, or uh, some popular person on YouTube. We find it in the scriptures. This is where we go to test what is true. And there's a, there's a story in the scriptures about the apostle Paul going into various towns to tell them the good news about Jesus. And he went into one town and he, he it was not well received. And then when he goes into another town, the town of Berea, they listened carefully and they were joyful and happy about this gospel that Paul was teaching. And they received it. But after Paul left, uh, they wanted to confirm that this was actually in the scriptures. So even if the apostle Paul said something, it's important to get it confirmed through the scriptures. So we have this term, Berean. Berean comes from the name of the town, Berea. And if you are Berean, it means you are like the Bereans. You are like the people from Berea. You go to the scriptures to confirm what people say. If, it's not, if it can't be confirmed through the scriptures, then we should not accept it as, as the word of God, as truth. So... I think that uh, that's what I'm getting out of chapter 16, verse uh, 1. The plans and reflections of the heart belong to man. So man can, we can make our plans and we can come up with our own ideas and our own uh, theories. Um, but the wise thing to do is to speak the word of God. 
So now let's look at this in uh, the KJV, uh, verse 3. No, verse 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. This is the problem with uh, um, the, the general philosophy of the world, and not just today, through all of history. And that is that man is basically good. And that, and, and that if those are people who are the best, if, you're, if you can be one of the best people, if you can be good enough, that God will approve of you and accept you and you can have eternal life in heaven. But that's a lie from the devil. Uh, throughout the scriptures, we learn that um, every man is a sinner. Um, and all the good things man attempts to do, in, in God's opinion, the best things we do still count for nothing. He says it's like filthy rags in the sight of God. So the problem man has is man thinks too highly of himself. And in his own eyes, he thinks that his ways are clean, that he's righteous, that he's pretty darn good. That's the first thing a person needs to correct. They need to repent. That means to change their mind about who they are and, and uh, realize that we're not all that good. Uh, in fact, Jesus said no one is good. Only God is good. Because when we think of good, we think of it in a relative sense. Like, I'm pretty good compared to that person. Um, but, but man is not, God is not comparing man against other men. God is comparing us against Jesus Christ, who sent the standard as perfection. So if you want to be good in God's sight, you have to be perfect. And if you can accept the fact that you can't be perfect through your own efforts, through your own performance, uh, that's the, the first step in understanding your need for Jesus and, and uh, your need for salvation by putting your faith in Jesus instead of putting your faith in your your own ability to perform and please God. So it says, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord with the spirits and in the amplified, it phrases it. All the ways of a man are clean and innocent in his own eyes, and he may see nothing wrong with his actions. But the Lord weighs and examines the motives and intents of the heart and knows the truth. So it talks about the heart. Jesus uh, said that, you know, the, the scriptures say you shouldn't murder. But I say, if, even if you hate someone, it's just as bad because you've already murdered them in your mind and in your heart. Uh, he's, Jesus said that the scriptures say that thou shalt not commit adultery. But Jesus went a step further and said, even if you think about someone in a lustful way, imagining, then you've already committed adultery with that person in your mind or in your heart. So Jesus wanted to really make us understand the impossibility of, of man being able to achieve this standard of perfection. That it's it's not only what we do, it's even our thoughts and our heart, our attitudes, our, our motives. Sometimes you can even do a good thing, but it's your motives were not pure. So Jesus, uh, I, I refer to his uh, sayings as the impossible sayings of Jesus over and over again. Jesus was making us understand that it's impossible. You cannot do it on your own. Admit defeat and 
cry out to God, just just like the the tax collector who did not even lift up his eyes to heaven, just laid prone on the ground and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He understood that he needed God to save him. Whereas the, the Pharisee, he thought he was all that, that he was really special. He was better than other people, and he was perfectly good in the eyes of God. Let's look at verse uh, 3 in the KJV. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Well, first of all, all the works. A well, work is uh, an action that you perform that is would be considered good. Um, for example, um, helping the old lady cross the street. That would be an action you perform that people say, well, that's a good deed. But even all the good things that we do before we get saved, they're meaningless. They count for nothing. Because, uh, as I've said before, I mean, if you're trying to get to heaven thinking that God is somehow has a balance scale, and when you die and you go to judgment, that he stacks your, your good deeds on one side of the scale and your bad deeds on the other side of the scale and sees which weighs the most. This is a concept found in Islam and basically all the religions of the world are based upon personal merit. Are you good enough? But the important thing for you to understand is that all the good things you do before you get saved, before you put your faith in Jesus, they weigh nothing. There's no substance to them. Because you're 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 trying to get to heaven the wrong way. In Romans 10:3, it says, says that man's confused. He, he's trying to get to heaven through his own righteousness instead of relying on the righteousness of Jesus Christ to save them. So if you're using this balance scale test, first of all, you can't put any good deeds on it because none of them count. But all, all you have are the bad deeds and the tilt, scale tilts in your favor. So commit thy works unto the Lord. Well, that, that, that is, that's an applicable statement uh, if you're already saved. I got to save, save December of 1986. Any good things I did before that were meaningless. After I got saved, then the good things I did started adding up. Jesus referred to this as building up your treasures for heaven. And so every Christian, once we get saved, after we put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in us, regenerates us. We're born again as a child of God, and the Holy Spirit starts transforming us. And once we become a child of God, after we put our faith in Jesus, then our ministry begins. That's right. If you put your faith in Jesus at any point in time, you have become a minister. And a minister just means servant. Uh, you, you are expected to serve the Lord in some way. Now, many people, uh, they don't know what they're supposed to do. The scripture says in Ephesians uh, uh, 2, 8, uh, 8, 9, it says, For by grace you say through faith, and that not of yourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But sometimes people neglect verse 10, which tells us there are works that we should be doing too. Not because we need to do works to get saved. Not because we need to do works to keep our salvation, not because we need to do works to prove that we're truly saved, but because as a child of God, we're in the family and we should pitch in. God desires for us to be part of his, his team, his family, the body of Christ. And he has a role for each of us to play. As Paul said, the body has many parts and the, the part that I'm going to play in it 
may be different than the part you're going to play in it, but we all have a part to play uh, in ministry. And so once you get saved, uh, the work does begin. And, and it says, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Let me see what it says in the Amplified. Commit your works to the Lord, submit and trust them to him, and your plans will succeed if you respond to his will and guidance. Uh, What I found is that there are a lot of people that they get born again and they have a desire to serve the Lord, but they don't know what to do. And I, I would say that your fervent prayer after you get saved should be, Lord, what do you want me to do? Reveal it to me and, and, and help me to, to do it. I found no greater pleasure in life than, than serving the Lord. And uh, we're, we're not all called necessarily to just focus only on one thing. My primary ministry, my service is, is in evangelism. I want to tell people the good news about Jesus so they can be born again and be assured eternal life in heaven. That's primarily what I believe I'm called to do. But that doesn't mean that I have to be limited entirely to that. There's other things that uh, I may have an opportunity to do in service for the Lord. And, uh, you know, I should be willing to do those things too. Uh, but we all have particular gifts and talents. Some of you watching this now might say, well, I, I could never talk to a camera the way you're doing it, Brother Luke. I couldn't go stand on the street corner and preach to the public about Jesus. Guess what? You're you're not expected to do those things that you're not called to do. If that's not a gift or a calling for you, then find out what is, because there is an equally important calling for you, and you need to find out what it is. Find out what the Lord wants you to do, and then just get busy doing it. The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Wow, I look at that in the Amplified. Let's see, the Lord hath made everything for his own purpose, even the wicked, according to their role, for the day of evil. Um, sometimes the Lord can even use bad people and bad things for his purpose. Uh, for example, he used certain tribes of people to wipe out the, the Jews and punish the Jews at certain times because the Jews uh, were not faithful to, to God who, who uh, brought them out of Egypt and saved, delivered them from, from slavery and then gave them a promised land and, and, and uh, uh, made them his chosen people. And yet they continually kept rejecting him and going to other gods. So in the, because of that, God would punish them, and he used evil people, other tribes of people, to for that purpose. There's an example of how God can do that. Let's look at this. Um, oops, let me look at that in the Amplified. I think I already did. Yeah. Let's look at verse 5 in the KJV. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. I talked last time about pride and the, how serious the problem of pride is. And the, the opposite of pride is humility. And uh, pride creates all kinds of problems. But the number one problem of pride is if you're full of pride, particularly spiritual pride, uh, that can prevent you from coming to Jesus because you're so full of pride, you don't think you need him. You think you're pretty darn good. So in that way, it prevents someone from being saved. Uh, so you, a person with pride needs to be 
humiliated. They need to be humbled. Some people don't willingly, voluntarily get down on their knees and say, oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Sometimes God knocks them down on their knees. They reach bottom. They hit bottom at some point, And their pride is removed and they're humbled. And when they're humbled, that's when they recognize their need for God, their need for Jesus Christ. Um, so pride is a big problem. It's also a pride, big problem for those many people who do get saved and then get proud after that, thinking that they're so, so great that they, they never sin anymore, that they're they, uh, better than other people. This spiritual pride is, it's a, it's a horrible thing. Matter of fact, if you take all the words of Jesus and analyze when did he raise his voice? When did he get angry? When did he call people names? Um, when he was dealing with the uh, extremely religious people, the Pharisees, who were full of spiritual pride. And he called them hypocrites, uh, vipers, whitewashed tombs, pretty on the outside, but on the inside, just dead men's bones. Uh, so Jesus, more than, more than anything else, I, I saw him angered with righteous indignation over spiritual pride. Uh, by mercy, verse 6, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Um, well, mercy and truth, uh, God is merciful. Um, I found that uh, the word mercy and the word grace are uh, it's very common that they're misunderstood and many people use them interchangeably as though they're synonymous but to me they're both equally important but they have a, i think an opposite meaning mercy means that you are spared a punishment that you deserve we deserve to go into the lake of fire because we're all sinners. We've all rebelled against God and gone our own way, the scriptures say. But God is merciful and he shows mercy and spares us that because we put our faith in Jesus. That's mercy. Uh, not getting a bad thing that you have coming to you. But grace is the exact opposite. Grace is uh, we don't deserve eternal life in heaven with God. We don't deserve that kind of joy and uh, eternal state of existence because we haven't done anything good to earn it or deserve it. It can't be earned. But God is gracious. Even though we don't deserve it, he gives us something wonderful that we don't deserve. So grace is receiving something wonderful that you don't deserve and mercy is not receiving something bad that you do deserve so when it says that by mercy and truth iniquity is purged uh iniquity is iniquity is uh, a uh, identification that we when we're identified as a sinner unfit to be with god this uh Iniquity is, pur is purged when we know the truth. It says, by mercy and truth, because God's merciful and because G Jesus is the truth, he's the truth you need to know. He's the truth you need to believe. The truth that God became a man named Jesus. He died for our sins on the cross. He raised himself from the dead. He promises us eternal life in the kingdom of God. Uh, if you put your faith in him, that's the truth that you need to understand and believe. And Jesus said, he is that truth. So by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Departing from evil just 
I mean, well, we should stop doing evil things because it, we should fear that God is going to spank us. He's going to chastise us. In Hebrews, it says God chastises the ones he loves. If it says if you're not being chastised by God, then you're not one of his. He's not going to chastise you if you're not one of his children. He's going to let you just wallow in your sin and and uh, ruin your lives. And but uh, when we do bad things, God knows that bad things yield bad consequences. We will reap what we sow. If if you decided that uh, you're going to uh, drink too much alcohol, become an alcoholic. And, and, and go out and hang around bars and then meet a, a strange woman and have an affair and cheat on your wife. If, if you do those things, then the probable consequences are your health will be lost because of alcoholism. You make it a sexually transmitted disease, running, further running your health. You, you will get caught and you will be divorced and you will not have even the ability to see your children. See all the bad consequences that come. So God knows that, hey, if you do certain things, you're going to end up regretting it. You're going to get reap what you sow. So that's why he doesn't want us to do sinful things, because he knows what's good for us. So it says the fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil, the fear of the law reaping and sowing, but also fear of the chastisement of God. Because he will uh, chastise means to, like a father, disciplines his children. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplify and see if it helps. By mercy and loving kindness and truth, not superficial ritual, wickedness is cleansed from the heart. And by the fear of the Lord, one avoids evil. Okay, let's go to verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Well, there's a lot of things that uh, we're told please the Lord. Certain attitudes that we should have, certain behavior that we should have, and but uh, one thing that scripture says it, it's impossible to please the lord if you don't have faith it says without faith it is impossible to please the lord so the, the first thing you need to do in order to please the lord is put your faith in him jesus christ as your savior then you've pleased the lord you've satisfied the one requirement so you get to go to heaven now as you live your life you should do all the other things that, that please him because you love him. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Isn't it natural once we understand how much Jesus loves us, that he was willing to become a man so he could suffer and die for our sins? Jesus said there's no greater love than giving your life for a friend. He gave his life for us. So isn't it natural to love him in return? And, uh, when we love him, then uh, we want to please him. Um, and so he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Well, if you have certain qualities, the qualities that God d desires for us to, to develop and, and embrace, uh, kindness, mercy, love, forgiveness, uh, be uh, soft, giving a soft answer, turns away wrath, as the scripture says. I mean, if someone is angry at you, someone is abusive to you, if you return it with anger, then you are th throwing fuel on the fire and escalating things and getting thing. The anger will just get worse. So Paul says that the best thing we can do is is return their hatred with love and kindness feed them 
give them something to drink, something to eat, show them loving kindness, even as they're being abusive to you, and they will be shamed. It says they will, it's like putting burning hot coals on their head. They feel ashamed of their behavior. I've had that happen numerous times in street preaching and here on YouTube where people, in their initial reaction to me was very abusive. And I responded in a, in a way that surprised them. I didn't return their abuse with more my own abuse. I, I returned their answer with a soft answer that was patient. And um, they told me many times I've heard people say, I'm, I'm ashamed of the way I talk to you. So these are things, these are principles that we learn from the scriptures that God wants us to develop these principles in our life. And if we do, even our enemies will not even be able to stay angry with us. Verse 8, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Yeah. Uh, righteousness, the only righteousness that we really can, can have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is imputed or, or uh, imparted on uh, all those who put their faith in Jesus. And uh, to have that righteousness, it's better than gold or silver or precious gems. And, and uh, if, if we had to choose between having great material wealth on earth in this lifetime and being able to have righteousness so that we can, we can go to heaven, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not our own, uh, it, it's a no-brainer that Jesus said, why are you trying to build up treasures on earth? It's just temporary. Uh, moths will destroy it. Rust will destroy it. It's temporary. You can't take it with you. He said, instead, build up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths can't destroy, rust can't destroy, and it's eternal. So it's far better to have the righteousness of Christ, be able to go to heaven, even if uh, you don't get these temporal things, the temporary treasures on earth. Instead, you'll have eternal treasures in heaven. Verse 9, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. Uh, it's, it's far better to follow the Lord instead of go your own way. Um, let me see in the Amplified, a man's, mind, a man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life, but the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. Um, it's, it's, you're going to get far better results in your life uh, when you... Uh, don't lean on your own understanding. Instead of trying to figure out yourself, you just go to the scriptures, study the scriptures, and this is, uh, the scriptures, the Bible has been called the instruction manual. Just like you get an instructional manual when you buy a, a computer or a television set or an automobile, it's an owner's manual. The Bible is our owner's manual. And that's where we go to to get our instructions. And if we follow that, it says, uh, a, man's, a man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life. Do you want to go through life just figuring it on your own? And if you do, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. And, and uh, um, if you will follow the instructions that we find in the scriptures, you're far better off. The, now let's look at that in the uh, Amplified, verse 9. A man's mind, a man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life. Oh, that was the Amplified. Let me look at it in the KJV. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Okay, now we'll go to verse 10. A divine sentence is in the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth, transgresseth not in judgment. 
Hmm. I want to see what the Amplified says about that. A divine decision given by God is on the lips of the king as his representative. His mouth should not be unfaithful or unjust in judgment. Sometimes it is because uh, kings are not all uh, listening to God and following what God wants them to do. Uh, even though the scriptures say that uh, they couldn't be in authority unless God permitted it, then uh, it doesn't mean that every judgment from a king or a president is, is going to be the right judgment. Verse 11, a just balance and honest scales are the Lord's. All the weights of the bag are his concern, established by his eternal principles. So don't cheat people. This is talking about a just balance. In other words, if, if, uh, if someone wants to buy so much grain and we weigh out the grain in order to sell them, say you get, you know, 10 ounces of grain for a dollar. But my scale is off on purpose in order so that you think you're getting 10 ounces, but you're getting only nine, then I'm cheating you, I'm stealing from you. So that's that's what this referring to is that a just balance, that's an honest scale. Be honest in your dealings with people. Don't cheat them. All the weights of the bagger is concerned, established by his eternal principles. So God's principle is, is let's not cheat each other. Let's be honest. Verse 12. Oops, let me go to Amp, uh, KJV. Verse 12. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him that speaketh right. Hmm. And yeah, look at that in the Amplified. Verse 13. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and he who speaks right is loved. Well, I'm not sure if this is saying that kings delight when they hear someone speaking righteously. Uh, or if it's referring to the king having righteous lips speaking the truth. And he who speaks right is loved. We, we, I will say that, uh, yeah, if you are going to speak honestly and be truthful, then you're going to be loved and respected rather than someone who's dishonest and lying all the time. Let's look at this in uh, KJV. Verse 14, the wrath of a king is as messengers of death, but a wise man will pacify it. Yeah. Hmm. I think that means if the king is angry, you should be not uh, make him more angry. Let me see. The wrath of a king is like a messenger of death, but a wise man will appease it. <laughs> I think that applies to, to kings or and just you know, all people. Uh, if, if someone is angry uh, and uh, getting ready to be violent, then don't, you know, you, you want to calm the situation down. You don't want to, you know, make them even more angry. It's, it would just be a fool, foolish thing to do. So appease it. And... Now we'll look at verse 15. In the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. There's a lot in here about kings because the common governmental system at that time were kingdoms and a king as, as the ruler. The uh, uh, Jewish people, there was a time where they didn't have a king. They had uh, prophet Samuel, and uh, but they, uh, they desired a king. And uh, they would have been better off if they didn't go to a system of, of kings. 
but they ended up getting Samuel and then David and then Solomon and other kings. But but um, originally, God didn't desire for them to have kings. Uh, and, and the kings uh, generally turned out to be big, big problems. Even Solomon, who wrote this book of Proverbs, uh, as wise as he was, uh, in the, the latter years of his life, he became quite foolish, uh, getting involved in other, other religions and false gods and all kinds of foolishness. And he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes when he finally realized that he'd made so many mistakes. Uh, his priorities got, were all wrong and he called everything else vanity. Everything is vanity and except for focusing on God and having a relationship with God. That's the only thing that's really truly valuable. Uh, but kings are referred to quite often because that was the, the kind of the, the common system of government. We still have some kings here in this uh, millennium. Um, I don't know the ratio of governments, but how many governments in the world have kings, probably a pretty small percentage today. But so that's why there are so many references here to kings. Um, I, I think we could often just say that or whoever has the most power in a country, whether it's a president or king or a dictator, uh, you know, it's it's whoever has the most power. If power is centralized with a, an individual, then we could consider them to be a king. Uh, verse 16, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than to be chosen than silver? So wisdom and understanding, uh, this was established in chapter 1, and chapter 2, chapter 3. We talked a lot about, about the uh, how valuable wisdom and understanding is and knowledge rather than accumulating gold and silver. And uh, if you follow this uh, study of Proverbs through the first 15 chapters, I'm sure that you've gained a lot of wisdom already from the study and the wisdom will serve you well. And I, I, I hope that you, you, one of the things that you've gained in, in your wisdom is the conclusion that wisdom is more valuable than material gain. In fact, if you have wisdom, you probably will have material gain and be blessed because because you're making wise decisions in your life. Verse 17, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserveth his soul. Again, it's just telling us that, hey, uh, over and over again, it's saying, don't get involved with bad people. They're going to lead you into evil act acts. Uh, make good decisions in your life uh, and, and uh, do the right things. If, you, if you're doing going down their evil road, then it's going to lead to destruction for you. Uh, but if you're, if you're not going down e the evil road, then your soul will be preserved. Your life will be better. And there's this constant contrast in the book of Proverbs contrasting doing the right thing and getting good results, doing the wrong things and getting bad results in your life. Then it says in verse 18, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Yeah. Pride. Uh, you know, I've talked about it a lot, and it's, it's, it's in Proverbs a lot because it is a serious problem. Pride certainly is one of the biggest problems in, in, in mankind. You've got pride, you've got hatred, you've got anger, you've got jealousy, you've got envy. All these things are bad qualities that many of us have to a certain extent. And pride is singled out here as before destruction, pride precedes it. So if you have any pride in you, it would be very wise for you to humble yourself and get rid of that pride. And even, as I said, there's many people who name Jesus as their savior and yet uh, I, 
I see so much spiritual pride in them. These lordship salvationists, these work salvationists, Calvinists. There's so many people that have spiritual pride. It's it's amazing to me because in order to get saved, the first thing is we need to be humble and say, I need to be saved. Verse 19 is, better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Okay. Uh, verse 20, he that handleth a matter wisely shall find good, and whoso trusteth the Lord, happy is he. Verse 21, the wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Prudent uh, is wisdom in action. If you're prudent, you're being wise and you're acting it out. So the wise in heart shall be called prudent and the sweetness of the lips increaseth learning. Let's see what verse 21 says in the Amplified. 21. The wise in heart will be called understanding. The wise in heart will be called understanding and sweet speech increases persuasiveness and learning in both speaker and listener. Sweet speech. Okay, let's go to verse 22 in KJV. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. <coughs> Sometimes we are trying to instruct someone and if they're foolish, they're not going to listen. And it would be folly on our part to continue trying to instruct someone who's foolish. If they're not going to listen, Jesus says, don't cast your pearls to the swine. If they don't have ears to hear, then dust off your feet and move away and go find someone who, who wants to listen. <clears throat> so, um, understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it. If you have wisdom, understanding, you're, you're going to be not only blessed, but happy to have it. Verse 22 in the Amplified says, uh, understanding, that spiritual insight is a refreshing and boundless wellspring of life to those who have it. I mean, I know that I have understanding to a certain extent. I know I don't have complete understanding. Who does? I've encountered some people on YouTube that seem to think that they know it all, seem to think that they are infallible. But I know that I'm fallible. I, I've been wrong on some theological questions over the years and I've had to be corrected and I've changed my mind about some things. So the fact that I realize I was wrong in the past and it tells me that it's possible for me to be wrong now about some things. So if you're, um, um, I, let me read it again, Amplify. Understanding, spiritual insight is a refreshing and boundless wellspring of life to those who have it. Um, so do, do we have understanding? Uh, well, we, we have it to a certain extent. And over a lifetime, hopefully, we gain more wisdom, more understanding. But I hope we never become so full of pride to think that you've got it all figured out and you understand everything perfectly. Uh, if you think that you understand every verse in the Bible, if you understand every word in the Bible perfectly, let me know. I want to meet you. I want to, I want to find the person that is omniscient, that knows everything, is infallible. Uh, what I'll really find is a person that's full of pride and arrogance. Um. But to give instruction and correction to fools is foolishness. So I hope that we can all learn that once we've identified someone as a fool, that means someone who's not really willing to listen. 
don't waste your time on them. Otherwise, you're also a fool because you can't understand that you're wasting your time. Let's go back to the KJV. Verse 23, the heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. I want to look at that in the Amplified. Verse 23, the heart of the wise instructs his mouth in wisdom and adds persuasiveness to his lips. Verse 24, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Pleasant words. Well, not only do I want to hear pleasant words, but I certainly would like to be able to speak pleasant words. And it says that it's, it's like a honeycomb. It's sweet to the soul. It, it makes your bones healthy. It makes, it's good for your health. And I've talked about this before, about how when people say kind things and encouraging things, if they even smile, that it's a, it's a blessing to me. And I've realized how much a blessing it is to me. So therefore, I, I, I make an effort to try to do the same to speak softly, show kindness, and, 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 and smile and laugh because it's a blessing to someone else. Um, verse 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It's very common for us to, to say, well, that doesn't seem right. The, the, the biggest example I can give you of that is salvation. Uh, people think that salvation has to be earned, that to go to heaven, you, you have to be good enough to deserve it and earn it. And uh, it, eternal life in heaven is a reward to those who earned it. That's what the world thinks as a whole. And when we tell people that no, salvation is a gift that we receive. Everybody who put their faith in Jesus, they get this gift of eternal life, not based upon personal merit. Uh, that doesn't seem right to man because God's ways are not man's ways. Man's way is thinking, well, you gotta, you got to earn it. And I've had a lot of people say, argue that it just doesn't seem right that, that uh, people can go to heaven who don't deserve it. Well, guess what? Nobody deserves it. If you think that you deserve it, then again, you're full of spiritual pride. And you don't understand your own sin. The Bible says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we've all sinned, and sin's a barrier. We can't go to heaven because we're all sinners. Now, maybe I've sinned more than you. Maybe you've sinned more than me. It's not the number of sins that are, that's the issue. If you have one sin, it's too many. Can you admit that you've ever sinned at all? Then that means you're disqualified. You can't go to heaven. You have to be perfect to go there. Does that, does that seem right to you now? You think you want to go to heaven because you, you, you've, you've earned it? Well, if you really want to earn it, you have to be perfect. That's the standard that you've got to meet. It's not a relative standard like that balance scale I talked about earlier. I mean, to, if your good deeds were weighed against your bad deeds, you only need... 51% good to tilt the scale in your favor. You could be 49% bad. 51% will tilt the scale. Does that seem right to you? 
don't you think the standards should be higher? Well, you couldn't even pass your final exam in high school with only 51% right. So uh, what degree of goodness do you think is, is, is needed? 90%. What if you're 90% good? 90% good. That should certainly tilt the scale, right? That's man's way of thinking. Well, some people say, oh, no, you got to even be better. 99% good. Even if you were 99% good and you even had a slight bit of sin in your lifetime, it's still, you still fail because the standard is not 90% or 99%. It's 100%. It's perfection. Now, when we tell people that, that's what the Bible says. We all fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Because we've sinned, whether it's one sin or a hundred sins or a million sins, we've all sinned. And therefore, the wages, what we get from it, what we deserve from it, is death. And that's referring to the second death in the lake of fire. That's God's way. Man's way is, well, I'm relatively good. I'm pretty good compared to that guy. That's man's way of thinking about things. So it says here, verse 25, there is a way that seems right unto man. The merit system. The merit system seems right unto man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. If you want to go to heaven through, your, through the merit system, you're going to end up dead in the lake of fire. Um, this leads me into the closing remarks here, which is, is about salvation, because the salvation, as we learn it from the Bible, biblical Christianity doesn't seem right to man. Man thinks the merit system is the right way. Well, if you want to go to heaven through personal merit, then you can try, but you have to be perfect. Jesus, that's what Jesus said. When, when Jesus was uh, telling the rich young ruler what he had to do, and uh, his, uh, his apostles said, well, Jesus said, if, uh, it, it's so hard for a rich man to enter the heaven. It's, it, it's like easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Camel fitting through the eye of a needle. And his apostles were shocked when they heard it. This is a new thing because they didn't understand that no one can, can uh, meet that standard. So they said to Jesus, well, master, if that's the case, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? Isn't that a good question? If it's, if it's, it's like going, putting a camel through the eye of a needle, through personal merit. That's how difficult it is if you want to get to heaven through personal merit. They said, well, Master, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. That's the first thing you need to understand. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, personal merit, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Getting to heaven through personal merit is impossible, Jesus said. But with God, it is possible. Salvation with God is impossible. Salvation through your own effort is impossible. But salvation with God is possible. And that's what the name Jesus actually means. It translates to God saves. Stop thinking you can save yourself. You can work your way to heaven. If you're just good enough and realize that's man's way. As it says in Romans 10, man's trying to get to heaven through his own righteousness, but that's not God's way. God's way is appealing to Jesus for salvation, going to him to get it. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man come unto the Father but by me. 
If you want to try to get to heaven through your own efforts, go ahead and try, but you're going to fail and you'll end up dead in the lake of fire. If you want to receive the gift of salvation, the Bible says the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, look up the word gift in the dictionary. And then look up the word reward in the dictionary. The word gift and reward are not synonymous. Mankind thinks that heaven is a reward for good behavior. But the Bible says no. Eternal life is not a reward, it's a gift. A gift is something that you receive freely that you didn't work for or earn. It's a gift because God is merciful, gracious, and generous. If you put your faith in Jesus, God gives you eternal life as a gift. You don't have to pay for it because Jesus paid for it on the cross with his life, with his blood. And a reward is something that you deserve. If salvation was a reward that you earned, then you could have the right to go to the judgment. And judge, God says, well, why should I let you into heaven? And you say, well, because I deserve it. I earned it. I was so good that you owe it to me. The merit system makes God your debtor. He owes you. But the grace system makes us the debtor. We owe God. He, he gives us eternal life as a free gift. And then what we owe him in return, not to get saved or stay saved or prove we're saved, but out of gratitude, can't we at least say, Jesus, you love me so much. You died for me. I can't help but love you in return. That's biblical Christianity. All right, I'm going to pick up uh, next time with, uh, let me see, ended with verse 25. I'm going to go pro thing here, go to Proverbs uh, chapter 16, verse 26 is where we'll go next time. Proverbs. Okay. All right. So not only are we learning wisdom from the book of Proverbs, but we're also learning wisdom unto salvation. The most important wisdom of all is knowing how to get saved. What do you have to do to get saved? The Philippian jailer asked the apostle Paul that very question. What must I do to be saved? The Apostle Paul simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. It's that easy. Put your faith in Jesus. Don't put any faith in yourself. Thank you for watching. Please join me every uh, Wednesday and Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time for Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.